Three and a half million years ago, the human animal stopped swinging in trees and started walking on the ground. Each human brought down with them their own unique way of communicating, their own unique manner in which they display emotion, and their own conflicts and ego. With eight billion of these human beings walking around the same earth, you may have a strong, compelling urge to run back up into the safety of the trees. But don't. Instead, learn. Learn how to live among the humans. As usual, yabba dabba do everybody. Uh, welcome, welcome, welcome. Today we will be talking about nonverbal messages. Uh, on the last video, we talked about verbal messages. This time we are talking about nonverbal messages. So, what does that mean, nonverbal messages? Well, it is communicating without words. And how do we do it? Oh, the ways we do it. We do it a lot of ways and we're going to learn all those ways that we do it. Um, with verbal messages, I started off telling you all what the principles were of verbal messages. I'm going to spend very little time on telling you what the principles of nonverbal are because we've already kind of talked about them and you'll see what I mean. I mainly want to tell you, uh, I want to talk to you about what the channels are for nonverbal messages. And if you don't know what a channel is, uh, you are about to find out. As I speak, I'm going to clean my glasses because I can barely see. Um, we talked about principles. Principles are characteristics of something. So for principles of nonverbal, well, if you remember, one of the first principles, the first principle for verbal messages, were that they're all oh, much better. Oh my God, I'm bald. No, I'm kidding. Um, one of the things about the verbal messages were that they are packaged. And we talked about that they're packaged with non-verbal messages. In other words, for me to say, hi, it's such a pleasure to see you. Um, something's wrong. My words are, it's a pleasure. My face is disgusting. Um, Something's wrong. So, same thing. Uh, one of the, the first principle of nonverbal messages is that nonverbal interacts with verbal. Uh, we smile when we want to show somebody that we are pleased. Uh, we wink to show that we're contradicting ourselves. Okay. Uh, a lot of little stuff like that. So, like I said, you know, we talked about it already. They interact one with each other, verbal and nonverbal. Uh, the next principle is that nonverbal messages, now I don't mean to glance over this, but we spoke about it a little bit, but uh, this principle, uh, nonverbal messages help manage impressions. You should know what this means now when I say manage your impressions. In other words, the impression you give others. Do you want to look smart? Uh, do you want to look professional? Uh, how do you want to look? Uh, the way you look is what you are putting out there as your message. We talked about if you want to be liked. You walk around with a pleasant look on your face. Uh, you get a warm handshake. We talked about that. To be believed. You want to look at eye contact. That's nonverbal eye contact. We'll talk about that. You want to keep open gestures to be believed. You know, that's one thing. This, this was all, every time I do this now, I think of Trump. And this is not political. Uh, he must have been told a million times that this shows that you are closed off. Uh, you are. It also shows you're not to be believed. You're hiding something. If you're not, you're open. Ladies and the gentlemen, ladies and gentlemen of the jury, I am innocent. You actually twirl all the way around to show that you are innocent. You are literally out there. Um, to excuse failure, so you mess up something, and instead of going, oh my goodness, I mess it up, you, you want to excuse your failure, so you might go, you, you put on a sad look. Uh, when you want to get help from somebody, I'll talk about this later, this is the one I love the best. When you want to secure help, 
uh, you give a, uh, a, but you don't want to ask for it. He, he, you give an open hand gesture. This, this, this is nothing. Oh, well, this is something, but not here. But you, you look like you've given up everything. Oh, won't somebody help me? But, but you're not asking that. You expect somebody to swoop in. Uh, you, you give a puzzled look. I love when I buy the copier and somebody will go like, huh. I don't say anything. I, I just sit back. And uh, I don't sit back like that. I sit back like this. But I know that they want to ask me, do you know what's wrong with this? But they don't, I don't know. Well, I do know. But they don't want to ask for help. So then you're there. Oh, man. You know, they're, they're making every sound except the word help. Uh, so that's the secure help. So one of the principles are we use our nonverbal uh, to manage the impression we want to give of other people. We also do it to help form our relationship. Uh, you'll hear relationships are mostly 90% nonverbal. Get, get rid of that. Uh, I'll tell you what, though, without nonverbal, without every now and then a, a touching of each other, a holding of a hand, a, a kissing, uh, some sort of nonverbal, a smile, uh, something like that, a hug, uh, it ain't going to last long. All right. We are now out of the principles of nonverbal. Like I told you, it was a quick little trip. And now let's go into these channels. So what is a channel? I'm giving you channels of nonverbal communication. And believe me, this is dynamite. I guess I should start off uh, as a good teacher. I should be starting off telling you guys why all this is important. Well, it's important for many reasons. Once you get good at this, you can actually give messages that you don't want to say out loud. You can, uh, you can also defend yourself against people that are trying to uh, manipulate you by, by having you offer the help. And then they could say, well, I never asked you, even though they were sitting there the whole time. Yeah. It's very good to know this. Look, I'll give you an example. I love jury duty, and I think everybody should do jury duty. I, I love uh, I love the bureaucracy of it, the, the going down to the court buildings. I love the whole procedure, and I, I think it's I think it's our responsibility as well. I would never try to get out of jury duty. However, uh, this time I, I had a sister that I took ill down in Florida, and I needed to get down there. Here's the problem. They sent me a jury duty notice in September. I said, I can't serve, man. I'll serve in the summer. I'm a teacher. They sent me one in January. I said, I can't do it, man. I teach. I'll serve in the summer. So they sent me my third and final notice. You will serve jury duty this summer. Uh, unfortunately, my sister literally went into a coma uh, about a day, be the day before I was supposed to start my jury duty. How do I get out of jury duty so I can get down to Florida to be with my sister to find out what's going on? Uh, they don't, uh, they, they, I'm on my third notice. There is no reason. I mean, I could plead, but once they hear my story, they, they might say, hey, you know, life is tough. How do I do it? In the old days, you could say, like, you have a prejudice against somebody. Oh, you know, can you, do you find any reason not to serve on the jury? You go, yes, because uh, I hate all men. Uh, I hate all women. Uh, I hate this type of people. I hate this type of people. You can't do that anymore. Uh, the judges know if you want to start acting like an idiot to get out of jury duty, they will realize that. I knew I could not verbally get out of jury duty, and since I know and love nonverbal messages, I thought I would communicate the message. What is the message? The message is, you don't want me on your jury. Please dismiss me. They can keep you at the time, I believe, three days. So you go sit before some people if they don't like you, the lawyers, they send you back to the pool. Then another lawyer from another case will gather you guys. You'll sit there. If they don't like it, they send you out. Um, but the first one is kind of to see if everybody's cool. The judge sits in on this one and, and everything like that. So that morning, I took a cup of coffee and I, um, I drank most of it. 
And then I took a nice white t-shirt, like the one I have on, and I poured a big coffee stain right on there. Big, brown, ugly stain. And then I, uh, I, I untucked my shirt like that, you know, so everything was, was very sloppy. Now, now dig this. I, 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 at first I had it like this, my hair. Yeah, I had it like, well, I put conditioner in it. Wow, it's very manageable. I had it where it would stick up. Uh, something like that. And I thought, no, that's no good. So I only put one side up. Uh, believe me, it looked a lot freakier. Wow, that conditioner is good, man. It wouldn't stick up. Look at that. Um, I look like a maniac. Uh, I look like uh, I could not exist in this world, let alone uh, <laughs> pass judgment on my fellow man. I also walked in with a very disgusted look on my face. And every now and then as I sat in my chair, which was chair number 19, I would also just go... I felt bad about doing this, but I had to get down for it. So, after making a couple sounds as well... Uh, uh, it was about 11.30 uh, in the morning. We had started at 9.30, and at 11.30, the lawyer said, okay, everybody, um, we're going to break for lunch. We would like you back here by 12.15. Uh, everybody except juror number 19, you are dismissed. Thank you for your service. I, I looked down at my chair to make sure I was 19. I went up to the lawyer just to make sure. I said, I'm, I'm done. You don't need me tomorrow. And he didn't even look at me. He said, nope, you're good. Uh, have the guy in the back sign your thing. It signed and I was out. I sent the message. I manipulated the message. I gave the message I wanted. Uh, I didn't really manipulate the message. I sent the message out there pretty boldly. I'm not the guy that you want on your juror. Uh, that's how good a nonverbal is. Here's another one. I love when I hear somebody's been arrested uh, for, let's say, uh, pot, uh, when it was that way, and maybe selling pot. They were arrested 19, 20, 21 times, and I'm thinking, huh, it's a lot of times to be arrested, you would think they would learn. Well, what happens is this this guy, uh, maybe he's just delivering the, the, the weed, uh, he, he puts on his backpack, he puts on his, you know, uh, whatever, his extreme stuff, uh, supreme, extreme, uh-oh, supreme, whatever, puts up the hoodie, you know, has the backpack full of his pot, uh, you know, wears the, lay, you know, walks in a certain manner to show he might be caring in case things get, and as he... Checks his phone and walks into an apartment building, uh, delivers his weed, comes out, waits, goes to another building. You know, two cops might be out there looking at this guy, uh, going, huh. On the third time he enters a building, the cops are going to go, come here, they're going to open up the backpack, and voila. Then you've got a guy, let's, I don't know, let's call him Freddy. Hmm. Freddy wears a suit and tie. Freddy wears black, black suit, black tie. He doesn't carry a backpack. What do you think he carries? That's right, a briefcase, an anti-shea case. Um, even in the summer, Freddie wears a black suit. In that anti-shea case is as much weed as was in that kid's backpack. But as Freddie dressed in his black tie, his white shirt, and his black blazer with his black pants and his dress shoes, and his anti-shea case, and, and beautiful glasses, as he walks from apartment building to apartment building and the cops look at Freddie, uh, the last thing they think is that he's a drug dealer. They think he's uh, the landlord collecting rents, uh, a realtor, perhaps, uh, even perhaps a Jehovah Witness or a solicitor of some sort. So, there you have it. Freddie's never been arrested. The other guy's been arrested 21 times. Why? Freddie knows how to use nonverbal. The other guy wants to send a message. He wants to send a message. Hey, look at me, man. I'm, I'm living the fat stack life. That's cool, but I'm not sure if you really want to send that message while you're actually 
doing the activity, if you know what I mean. All right, let's get out to this. So what are these channels? Well, the channels I just told you about were basically artifactual. You'll learn about that in a moment. In other words, they have to do with uh, things that man made. In other words, uh, or women made. Uh, objects uh, such as clothing. So the clothing was in both situations. Um, a channel is something that, think of it as a vessel. So I've got, uh, I've got my engagement ring and I'm going to propose. What vessel do I want to put it into? Do I want to put it into the champagne glass? Do I want to put it into the chocolate mousse cake? Uh, do I want to put it, I don't know, underneath her pillow. Uh, the message is the ring, but what vessel am I going to choose to put it in? Same thing with a nonverbal message. So I have a message. What vessel do I want to carry that? The message I want to get out of jury duty was the artifactual communication. Uh, we'll talk about that. So let's talk about these different types of channels. And the first three will be very familiar. And then we'll get into some channels that you might have never really thought go with nonverbal. Let's talk about it. One of the first ones we just spoke about it earlier, body messages. So one channel that you could send a message out is through your body. Um, if I want to tell you if you come up to me and you want to convince me of something, and I'm not going to believe you no matter what, for I don't know what reason, uh, I could say to you right off the bat, you know what? Don't even bother. I don't believe anything that comes out of your mouth. Well, in a certain situation, I might not be able to say that. Uh, so I could choose, instead of saying that, I could choose the same nonverbal with my body. I could close off my arms. I can, you know, I can actually turn my body away. We do that a lot of times when a conversation is, uh, when we meet somebody in the street and it's time to go. We literally will maybe shake their hand, which is another nonverbal message we'll get to. But we position ourselves. If, the, if somebody doesn't get that cue, we kind of position ourselves even more like, okay. It's good to see you. Talk to you later. Uh, some people don't get those cues. So we do. Uh, our body appearance, the appearance itself, has a lot to do also with the message you send. That coffee stain, uh, it, it kind of was a body message. Well, I want to get, I don't want to confuse you. We'll keep that for artifactual. My hair, though. Uh, possibly if my hair I made it all dirty and, and greasy there's a message going out there I, I might have a mental illness or I might just be lazy and not care uh, there are studies all over that say attractive people do have more opportunities uh, even taller people, how do they do this? I mean, yeah, a lot of research. Taller people make more money on an average. Uh, however they do it. And if money's your degree of success, so be it. Um, but attractiveness through research, it's got an advantage in almost all areas. I don't need to tell you that. You, you already know that. Now, we all uh, can't be blessed being great looking. But we can do things. We, we can take care of, of our hair. Uh, we can keep shaving, uh, keep our face washed. We, we might bleach our teeth if they're getting stained. If you smoke uh, like I do, you, you might want to do some crest strips every now and then. Uh, you, you might not want to uh, gain weight just because you don't make the right food choices, if there's something else going on, okay. But if it's only because, eh, you know, that's okay. Uh, but 
you don't you won't have an advantage a, a lot of people especially nowadays people really look at uh, uh it, it's funny when i began school in 2005 cigarettes were the number one killer my health professor was a genius of a man uh, and he said that he predicted in five years that obesity would be the number one killer and obesity is indeed now the number one killer it has surpassed cigarettes uh and, and that's that so in other words if i'm hiring i know that uh people that are obese it might cost me a lot more money life's not fair uh, but if my job is to make sure my bottom line stays intact I, I, I'm not going to hire unhealthy people. That goes with smokers, with, with, with drinkers, with anything. So you want to uh, you want to send out a good message as well. Uh, some people overdo it, or they just want you know the, the real buff people, women as well. You know, you know, especially the ones that take the pills to get that big. They they want to they want to send the message that they're strong, they're tough. One of the other ways now, another vessel. So you get it. One vessel we could use is our body. Another vessel we could use is facial communication. Yes, of course. Uh, we smile. We we agree with people. We, you know, here's a here's a psychiatrist that you'll pay. You know, you'll, you'll talk for two minutes, and when you're all done, they'll go. And then you'll keep talking for another two minutes. And that, that shows that they, they kind of feel for you. Oh, we, we do that. We, we also show when we're disgusted. We, we roll our eyes, uh, which is facial expression. And there's also eye contact, which is the next one. But yes, of course, we have our face show. So that's another way we communicate. If you want to walk around all the time with a, uh, a bad look on your face, then don't be surprised if the message you're sending is that nobody really wants to talk to you because you're sending a message. Uh, once again, Seinfeld, uh, George says, if you ever want people not to bother you at work, just always, always look angry. And anybody would go up to George and go, do you got a minute? George would go. And the guy would go, oh, forget it, before George even spoke a word. One day I'm going to write Larry David and ask him if I could start a class about Seinfeld because it's, it's, it's all in here. Um, okay. The next way, our third vessel we could use is eye contact. Eye contact... Uh, it's the study of eye messages. It's big, Oculus. It's it's a big thing. Uh, there's a lot of studies of it. Uh, things like what is the length of a gaze before somebody gets upset? Like, hey, what are you looking at? Uh, about 2.95 seconds before somebody asks or looks back at you. Uh, we... If the person's looking right at you, when you look at them, it's about 1.18 seconds before somebody goes or looks away. It's like the staring contest you did. Uh, the shorter gaze means the less you're interested. The longer gaze means that you're interested. So, uh, you know, there's that bar scene. You know, and there, there's a nice little dance that goes with the eyes. The guy will first look at the woman, and it could be the other way around. Don't, don't get all wrapped up in that. The guy might be looking at the woman. The woman knows he's looking, but won't look. Then he looks the way she looks. Then he looks. She looks, catches his eye for about 1.18 seconds and looks away, but then looks right back. And if he's still holding the gaze, He's interested. By the way, this isn't just, well, it's a lot of experience, uh, but this is also studies about how people make their contact with the eyes. I love the one where the one will look away, and then when they look back, if the other person's still looking at them, they're interested. It's also pretty creepy uh, if you do look back and you don't want that person to be looking at you. Uh, then you send a message, you don't shout out, looking at me! You choose another vessel, a nonverbal message, which is 
the last one we learned, more than likely, you're probably going to send a facial communication. Now that's from experience. Uh, yes, long days is. Research has shown they will start physical violence. Yeah. One of the worst things you could hear on a train. You sit there minding your own business and all of a sudden you hear, what are you looking at? And you're like, oh, please don't be talking to me, even though I was just looking at the paper. All right. Uh, here we go. Let's get into some other ones that you might not know. So we all know those three. I mean, come on, man. Uh, of course we know it. Body messages, facial communication, eye contact. All right. What about these other ones? How about touch? Touch. Yeah. Touch communication, nonverbal. One of the most primitive forms of communication. And when I mean primitive, man, I mean primitive in your chronological order, uh, not primitive in human beings' life. In other words, you're sitting there and you're not even born yet. And man, it is beautiful there. You're, you're swishing around and you have fluids that are just pressing up against you perfectly. You feel food going into you. Uh, you hear that mother's heartbeat. There's a lot of senses going on. But mainly that fluid is really, really touching you. And you're so comfortable and so warm and then all of a sudden... <laughs> And out you fly. Uh, you're in open air, man. Where's that liquid? Where's that nice, snuggly comfort you had of the womb? Where, where's that heartbeat that you, all your senses, now you're hearing, ee, 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 da, 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 you're hearing all your, wow, your whole, <laughs> good luck, kid. Uh, that's why you grab that kid, uh, you, you, Swallow them in a, in a tightly wrapped cloth. You 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 hold you you give that kid to the mother and the father the second you can. I learned through child development, American Indians. Well, there might be other cultures. We looked at the American Indian who had it right. They carried their papooses. They carried not on the back. They carried their child from birth right next to their chest. So they they got this body temperature. They heard that heartbeat. They felt the warmth of the body, the touch, just as though they were in the womb. Uh, not much difference from there to right hair, except interior and exterior. So, yes, when I say it's a primitive form of communication, you bet it is. How do we, uh, what messages do we use uh, to, uh, to put in the touch vessel? to go out, things we don't want to say, well, <laughs> emotions. If you want to find out, uh, you know, in the real early stages whether somebody likes you or not, uh, you more than likely won't ask them, do you like me? You, you might try holding their hand very slowly. Uh, if they take your hand, you could tell. Do they, are they really taking your hand? Are they being polite? Do they, do they draw their hand away very quickly? If so, they're not interested. If they do hold your hand and maybe give it a little squeeze, that, that's, that's almost telling you what took you so long. Isn't that romantic? All these messages, I like you by touching the other person squeezes. What took you so long? They squeeze back saying, don't worry about it. Uh, touching playfulness, playfulness. I don't walk by Sheila, uh, and when I want to send a message, I, I love her, I'm glad I'm living in the same house as her, I'm glad she's alive, I'm alive, we found each other, all that stuff. As I walk by her in the house, I don't say, hang on a minute, darling, and I get her and give her a big kiss. As she walks by me, I, I give her a shove, maybe. Uh, I give her a little, she might give me a little flick on, on my head. It's playfulness. Go to the zoo, see sea otters. All, all they do is they, they, they go, you know, it's playfulness, touching. Uh, we use it sometimes for control. 
unfortunately, but hey, listen, I was talking romantic. You might want to tell somebody to stop. You put your hands on them, on their shoulders. Stop. You might say hurry <laughs> and push them a, a little bit. Um, and we also use touch for rituals. I mean, if somebody puts out their hand to you and you don't shake their hand, good Lord, that may start a war. Because I didn't touch their hand. Like, I didn't really shoot anybody. I didn't spit in their face. I didn't touch their hand. Uh, yes, it's, it's a ritual. It communicates you're part of the social contract. All right. What is another form of nonverbal? Another vessel. This is a little thing called para language. Para language. It's vocal. Ah, don't get confused. This is why I bring this up because it is vocal. So therefore, oh, it's verbal. Yeah, but you'll see what I mean. It's the nonverbal dimension of the verbal. Ah, isn't that cool? That'd be a great book. The nonverbal dimension of the verbal. What does that mean? 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 Um, each one. Now, that was a simple one. But, so, you already know. It's the emphasis you put on a word. The one we study when you study this is a beautiful line in Faust. Uh, Faust sells his soul to the devil. And uh, he, he asks to travel the universe. And, and meet just everybody from the literary world to historic figures. And he sees Helen of Troy. And if you don't know your history, learn it. It's pretty cool. Uh, you know, Helen was kidnapped and all this stuff. So the guy that really loved her sent a thousand ships to go get her. So that's a lot of ships back then for one person. Uh, so... When Faust sees her drifting through the universe, he looks at her face and he says, is this the face that launched a thousand ships? So that's where the line comes from. So you could say, is this the face that launched a thousand ships? You're almost saying, is, is this Helen? Is, is this her? Is this the face that launched a thousand ships? You, you might all be communicating this face, maybe 200 ships, maybe 300, but a thousand. Is this the face that launched, launched almost like really? That they really got together a uh, mobilization of these? Is this the face that launched a thousand ships? In other words, I can't believe the amount of ships. So, we know exactly. Uh, once again, Seinfeld. Larry David, if you're hearing this, give me permission, man. Seinfeld. Uh, Jerry wanted to go to a party. He wasn't sure whether he was invited or not. So he had a friend ask him. And uh, the guy said back to his friend, said, why would I invite Jerry? So when Jerry asked his friend, said, what did he say? He said, why would I ask Jerry? And Jerry was like, yeah, but did he say, why would I ask Jerry? Why would I ask Jerry? Why would I ask Jerry? That example didn't go good. All right, forget it, Larry. Maybe it won't work out. You see what I mean? A lot of times we emphasize words and we do it on purpose. All right, another vehicle. Another channel for our nonverbal is silence. What did you think I was communicating right there? Did you think I was communicating thinking? Because if I pause, it might really make me think, make you think that I really am picking my words carefully. There we have it. 
So you could see how that silence sometimes can be used to... See, that doesn't... I didn't use that silence good. That silence looked like I didn't... Like sending the message, I forgot. I don't know what I'm doing. So silence can be used quite a bit. Silence can send out some deadly messages. Sticks and stones may break your bones. It is indeed a skillful art. Those sticks and stones will do good. It is silence that will break the heart. Silence. Silence is tough. Uh, I look back at some of the people that I, I don't know, that weren't kind to me. I think I should have been a lot more silent to them. Instead, I kept giving them a reason to be that way. Um, silence communicates just as intensely, if you use it right, as any other nonverbal deal. Uh, it provides you time to think. Makes you not look like you're panicky. Uh, you can use it to hurt. Yeah, you you don't talk to somebody who will break your heart when you don't hear from somebody that you love and they were supposed to love you. Um, use it a lot of times to communicate. I'm sorry, to prevent communication. I've walked into meetings where I don't feel like talking. So I don't talk right off the start. And it will get around... Probably, non-verbally, hmm, he doesn't want to talk. So we use silence to actually prevent communication as well. Um, so that's it. Uh, the ultimate in thinking, as in communication, is silence. That's Max Picard, man. He's a he's a heavyweight in the in the whole communication business. All right, here's another one that you might not think is a non-verbal vessel: spatial. Spatial. Spatial means proximity distance. Uh, so, we... How is this communication? Well, you ever have somebody who kind of wants to intimidate you? What do they do? They get close to you. Do you have anybody that ever wanted to make a move on you? Get romantic? What do they do? They get closer. That was my problem. I used to mix up the bullies with, with the romantics. Uh, there's a joke in there somewhere, but I would never put it on tape for all those who want to cancel me. Um, so, yes, we have a good distance, you know, and it's... Um, it's something. Our, a bunch of research shows that we like our personal space from about 18 inches to 4 feet. In other words, if I'm just hanging around by myself, let's say in the library, I'm cool until somebody gets within about 4 feet. Then I'm like, yeah, what's up? Uh, how do we know this? Because the way this research is done is we, we gather a bunch of people uh, and we put buzzards, little buzzards or something in their pocket that come back to us, the researcher. So let's say I'm doing the research. So I'll, uh, I'll put somebody in a library and I'll say, okay, walk around. And when somebody gets close enough to you where you feel uncomfortable, hit that buzzer. So those are what we get. We get that. Uh, same thing, uh, maybe possibly in a uh, restaurant. Uh, now, we go to a park. Let's say it's 6 in the morning, and one of the best things as the opening of breakfast in Tiffany's is, is to see New York at about 5.30, 6 in the morning before the city has the people in it. You only get to see the nice structures, not too many people. So let's say you went to Central Park where that beautiful fountain is, and there's a huge open space, and you're the only one there. How far 
does a person, how close do they come to you in that type of setting before you hit your buzzer? And it shows about 18 feet. So, I know this. Here's the good guy, me, that nobody knows. You know, I worked a lot of times in night jobs when I was waiting tables and cooking and doing stuff. I found myself walking home at about 3.34 in the morning. And whenever I was on a sidewalk and I saw a woman coming my way, I would actually cross the street to take the stress off them. Because I do know, now I, now I know because of academics, but I, I always saw their panic, uh, you know, and I'm, I'm a big guy. And, and I, I guess to be honest with you, I probably got insulted. I probably got offended so many times of watching them cross the street or grabbing their purse tighter. I understand it, but also don't understand, but also don't be offended if I'm offended. So now when I see them, I cross the street, because I know this spatial thing. Hey, if it's 12 noon on Fifth Avenue, I'm not going to cross the streets to make them comfortable. But 3.30 in the morning, come on. Uh, so, yes. Um, what else do I want to tell you about this? Do, 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 do. Clients are kept at ease. Uh, spatial. <clears throat> That's about it. Okay. Uh, here's a big one. Artifactual communication. This is the one I think a lot of... Uh, People could, uh, could do right away, actually. Um, artifactual communication, what does that have to do with? Well, think of the word artifact. Uh, you, you might think of an artifact. When I ask students what is an artifact, they usually say stuff like, oh, it's something very old, uh, something in a museum, which could be true. But at one point, this paperclip is an artifact. Uh this is an artifact. This cord is an artifact. Uh, it will probably never hang in the museum. Uh, my notes may. Uh, it will never hang in a museum. But what does artifact mean? It means a man-made object. So anything that's made man-made is an artifact. Well, they've got to change that, huh? Man-made. Uh, I, I, I would think they would work on that kind of stuff uh, right away. Because that sounds weird. Even I don't feel comfortable saying a man-made person made. I don't know. Created. Created by humans. Um, so, yes, that's what it is. I remember uh, when I was a young man, uh, if I had a date and I was hoping the date was going to end up at my place, you bet I would do space decoration, artifactual communication. First off, I would clean the place. So it looked, so the message I was sending was, I'm not a slob. Next, I buy a GQ. <laughs> I, you know, I buy like a stylish men's magazine and I, I place it. And we know this. We, we, we've seen it on sitcoms. We also know realtors do this. You would stage your own apartment. I know people that, you know, they sell books like this, where when you take out, this, you go like this, and it's hollow. It's just the front. So, like, I read every one of these books. This is, and I'm not, you know, it's like 20 years worth. But every one of these books are pretty much read. Uh, and I've got some more at home, but that's about it. But, like, nobody could fill some of these bookcases you see in these libraries. And who wants to spend... 30, I mean, some of these libraries in people's homes have 5,000 books. Uh, I mean, if each book costs $10, that's $50,000. If each book costs 100 dollars buy. So it's cheaper just to buy the, the fake books, like the Hollywood scene. That's artifactual communication. They are uh, trying to send a message that they are smart, they are well-read. No, they're not. It's hollow. It's fake. It's a facade, man. Uh, so you see where we're going. Uh, yeah, we, we decorate our thing with space. Uh, or we decorate our space to send messages. I won't show you uh, because there's a lot of, it's not my business. But here's a message I show my students in my office space. That's it. 
There, there's, there's nothing else. There's no political stuff up there. There's no pictures of my family up top. Those are school books, old school books, to show that I'm interested in what? In my students. And there's nothing about me whatsoever in here. Now, I'm not saying it's wrong to put stuff on about you or pictures of your husband or, or your wife, but those are the people that want to send a message to the colleagues that, look at me, I got a life outside of this building, which is cool. I don't feel the need to send that message. I feel the need to send the message that I care about the students. Uh, whatever. Uh, but, but neither what. But what I'm saying is space decoration. I once bought a trumpet because a movie Chet Baker, Let's Get Lost, was out. And trumpet players were very popular then. So I bought a trumpet and put it in my bedroom. So a girl would come and go, oh, do you, you play trumpet? I'm like, oh, yeah. They'd say, oh, can you play something? i say, yeah, I would, but right now my, I, I don't have much lip, which is a which is a jazz thing for trumpeters. You got to have lip. Sometimes you got it, sometimes you don't. Oh, when can I hear it? As soon as my lip comes back. Still waiting for my lip. Uh yeah, we uh, we put our magazines out to show what we're interested in. Um, here's the thing. Here's what I want you to really understand about artifactual communication and about nonverbal communication as a whole. I can sit you down and I can ask you to tell me about yourself in an hour. And you will only give the information that you want to give me in that hour. So anything you want to hide, you'll hide. However, if I were to go into your bedroom without you there, or into your apartment, or your house, and got to look through all your stuff, I would find out much more than you would tell me. What kind of things would I find out? I'd find out your religion. I'd find out your race, I'd find out what kind of friends you have, I'd find out if you're artistic, I'd find out if you're smart, I'd find out uh, if you're, uh, what your sexuality is, I would find out almost everything. What do you think? I've seen guys grill for eight hours. Did you murder them? No, I didn't. They get a search warrant. They look. Where's the gun? Artifactual communication with the fingerprints on it. They did it. Oh, hey, yeah, what do you think they do? Detectives, they let the room speak to them. Okay, let's look around. If you ever watch Monk, a monk does this stuff. He looks around. The, the whole thing is about nonverbal communication. So there's a fireplace. A fireplace should have uh, those tools. Ah, there's tools, but there's only three tools Usually there's four. There's a dustpan, a broom, a poker, and a large prong. Where, where is the poker? The poker is missing. Ha ha. Find the poker, you will find the murder weapon. Find the murder weapon, you'll find the murder. So, yes, you don't think all of that, all you students who are interested in CSI and all those things and all those murder things on ID. Uh, by the way, I love them. Uh, yeah, a lot of that is to artifactual communication. I can walk into an apartment and tell you probably how old the people are. How? Probably by the use of, by what technology they have. Do they have a TV set? Most, most uh, young people at the age of 22, 23, they don't buy the TV. Unless they're real sports, and if, there's, if they've got a big screen TV, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to assume right off and then look for other things that we've got some sports buffs here. Uh, most people at 22, they're, they're going to watch on, their, on other devices, not the TV. Do you have not a flat screen? Do you have an old TV that's not even a flat screen? You're probably from an older generation. Uh, do you have an old phonograph? I'm not talking about these retro uh, vinyl players. I'm, I'm talking, so just looking through tech. I mean, I have tape recorders, cassette tape recorders. I don't throw it out. If somebody were to, I don't use it, but if somebody were to come into my apartment, they could guess that I am indeed 60 years old. Who else has an old-fashioned tape recorder? Uh, cameras. Uh, 
that almost nobody, I would be willing to say, under the age of 25 has an old camera that you have to have the film developed, unless when it's those retro ones. Um, so right off that, um, ethnicity. Could probably go through your refrigerator. I, I could look through your refrigerator and tell you, uh, and through your pantry, uh, is, is there a line of products uh, that are for one, like Goya, okay, is the Hispanic. There are uh, Hala, uh, there's a Hala sauces. I know how is the way, but there's also a line of those sauces. Uh, it would let you know if I see a lot of, I can look at it. In fact, there was an article during the election that you could see uh, a Bernie Sanders refrigerator or a Trump refrigerator. And as you guess, the Trump refrigerator, I don't know, it was on higher, colder, it had meats in it, uh, where Bernie Sanders had like vegetables, had a yogurts. Stuff like that. But nonetheless, yes, I can open up your refrigerator. I can ask you, are you healthy? And you could say, yeah. And I could say, do you eat healthy? And you say, yeah. I, I don't believe you. I'm 60, like I just said. I've been around the block. I'm going to go to your refrigerator and open it. If, if I care. I mean, I don't really care. But that's going to tell me whether or not. Um. We'll find out later on, mainly with relationships. Behavior. Listen to what I say. Behavior is nonverbal. You could believe somebody's words, or you could believe their behavior. Hopefully the two are the same. That's all I'm saying. Uh, I could tell whether or not the family has a lot of, if they're a busy family, or if they make time to be together. Is their kitchen table full of stuff? Full of papers? Is, 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 is their, di I'm sorry, their dining room table, wherever they eat. Or is there even a place to eat? But if, is the dining room table or kitchen table have stuff on it that has nothing to do with eating? Then more than likely, they're either too busy or too broken to be sitting down at one time as a family to share what's going on. Uh, are the chairs centered around the TV for older people? Is the whole living room revolved around the TV? If so, there's a very good chance that less conversation is going on. Rather, if you had a living room setting where the TV was hair, and the two couches were here facing each other. That lets for conversation. You might already start thinking about how offices are designed, how psychiatrists' offices are designed. If they really care about it, it has a lot to do with it. Is there a TV in the bedroom? If so, they're probably older, older people. Uh, because when you're young, the bedroom is for sleeping and other activity. It's not really for watching TV. But when you're old, you're going to fall asleep. So I might as well fall asleep in bed and be comfortable. Uh, color communication. Gangs. <laughs> Red, blood, blue crips. Who was it? Junior? I think Junior. Such a sad story. He got mistaken for a crip. I think he was wearing blue. And there is a great ID murder called the boy in blue. He was wearing blue. Some gang was out. He was sending the message by wearing blue. He was a crip. At least, remember, messages are in people. The crips. I mean, the bloods, the red ones, the red team. Looked at the guy in the blue, and they got the message. He, he's, he's on the blue team. And they killed him. Uh, yeah, that's colors. Color communication. The goth kids. Oh, I love the goth kids. God bless them. I love them. They don't wear bright colors. They, they want to show sadness. They want to show that the world is, is, is cruel. It's depressed. They wear black. Uh, those colors. Uh, green. What does green stand for? Green stands for... Uh, Go. You got the green light. 
uh, on my stock account, if I'm doing well, it's green. If I'm doing bad, it's red. Uh, green also is capitalism here in America. Uh, don't kid yourself. The Wizard of Oz, it's a book about capitalism. The Emerald City, the Yellow Brick Road, yellow, paved with gold. That's another one, yellow. Uh, yellow in China means wealth. Red, red in China also means prosperity. Green, like I said, in the U.S., capitalism. Black, that means death in a lot of places, especially Thailand. Um, I had a student challenge me on this just last semester, so I hope the thing is, uh, I said in Iran you will not see the color blue, and somebody said that's impossible. Uh, blue is a very negative color. Look it up. I don't know. I've never been to Iran. It's, it's I'm only the carrier of what I hear. Uh, but yes, uh, very negative so much that the uh, Iranian state will not allow the color blue. Uh, white, white. Uh, here in America, white is purity. Uh, in Asian, it also means death. Uh, yellow, we talked about it, especially in China, wealth. Uh, purple, in Latin, uh, Latin America, purple is associated with death as well. Um, even an instructor in the clothing they wear, if an instructor dresses more like me, uh, where it's kind of informal, let's say. What messages are they sending? And what do we get? It's not what I do. So we have a professor dressed in a suit and tie, and we have another professor just like me. So what do the students pick as the characteristics? So for a professor dressed like me, they consider that I will be friendly, I will be fair, I will be enthusiastic, and I will be flexible. For the formally dressed professor, they say that they're organized, they're knowledgeable, and they're prepared. So what do you know about that? All right. Uh, oh, I want to keep these under an hour, but that ain't going to happen. Maybe. So let's go. Uh, the next one, olfactory. 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 What does that mean? Smell. All right. It's a peculiar aspect of nonverbal communication. It's kind of grouped with artifactual communication. Uh, if you have body odor, if something smells, well, hang on. If you prefer to get the body odor, uh, I talked about uh, baking bread in an earlier video. Video that you bake bread in an apartment or a home you're trying to sell, so it doesn't. Smell like a house. It smells like a home. Freshly baked bread. So we already kind of dealt a little bit about this. So we want to get that smell. Oh, we did it with sensory, how you get your perspective. That's it. So um, we are animals. And we forget we're animals. Yes, this is going to go a little over an hour. So bear with me. It's worth it. Especially when I'm calling us animals. We are animals. Uh, some of the things we were born with have evolved. Uh, one thing they always talk about is, do we need the pinky toe anymore? Well, why do we have smell? Smell enhances everything, but let's face it. If you go blind, it's a tragedy. If you go deaf, it's a tragedy. If you go mute, it's a tragedy. If you lose your sense of touch, it's probably going to be a tragedy, because it will be a tragedy. But if you lose your sense of smell, it means you're a smoker. Uh, pretty much so. Uh, it's not that much tragedy. Why do we have our sense of smell? Do we still use it? I mean, look at bears. Uh, I mean, when I go hiking, I, I've got to hike upwind, as they call it, because if it's downwind, they're, they're going to smell it. Uh, sharks can smell blood, supposedly. I, I don't know about that, but supposedly that's what they hear. I don't have the facts to back it up, but the bear I know about. Uh, but you know what? We're a lot better off smelling than we think we are. We just don't use it. Uh, we are able to identify our relatives through smell. How do we do that? Well, you get about 10 people, line them all up, group one of them, make them your relative, 
then bring in the subject, put a blindfold on them and say, smell away. So they smell each person and then all of a sudden they smell one and go, mom, dad. Uh, yeah. Think about maybe you had a friend's house you went over to and their house had a peculiar smell to it or a unique smell. I still know some houses. I still remember the houses that smelled like mothballs. I know the houses that, uh, you know, smelled a certain way. So we can smell. You think that only dogs can smell fair? We still can smell fair. Uh, same kind of research, but this time we put the people in front of a computer and then we did like a nice video and then all of a sudden we threw in a scary face and the person went Meh! and the other person was able uh, to smell it. We had the other person blindfolded with earplugs but they were able to smell it. Uh, illness and relative age. Relative age within about five years from smelling people. They could tell how old they are. Yes, a baby, a uh, 10-year-old, uh, especially the breath, uh, it's, it's sweet. They started eating at 10 at, at birth. The breath is fresh, baby's breath. Uh, they make a flower out of it. At 10 years old, the breath is sweet. They're eating candy, chewing gum. At 18, uh, it's a little, they might have some dental work. Now we're getting that. Uh, by the time they're 90, believe me, you don't want to smell the breath. Uh, we know about illness. We also use smells to manipulate. We know this, perfumes, stuff like that. Uh, but, I mean, marketers do that. Lemon. Lemon. You smell lemon. What do you think? Cleanliness, health. Uh, lavender increases alertness. Uh, rose oil reduces blood pressure. This is why this olfactory is a... Uh, I, I'm very interested. If I was a younger man... I might really look into this because if you look at patients who have uh, Alzheimer's, what is very sad is they forget people that love them, that were their companions. So you might have a, a man or a woman who's 92 years old that has a wife or a husband who is the same age but is not suffering uh, Alzheimer's. And the 92-year-old, uh, the 88-year-old walks in, uh, and let's say the 92-year-old guy, let's say, doesn't recognize his wife anymore. Uh, and not only that, he might tell the wife, hey, I think I'm in love with another woman who's also in this facility. Very sad. Very common. And then the wife has to decide whether or not, or the husband. To let the wife or the husband that's got this Alzheimer's, should I let him go and live a new life with this individual, even though I've been with this person for 60 years? Very, very sad. But I'll tell you what, you might be too young, but some of you are watching this video who are older, you know what I mean. You might be in a stranger's apartment or in a hotel and you, you take a shampoo you never used before and all of a sudden you smell it and you're transported back to when you were 12 years old because that smell of lavender was reminded of lilac reminded you of a field you played in that was full of lilacs. So what they're saying is if it jogs the memory if smell jogs memory, can we use smells to jog the memory of Alzheimer's patients? Wouldn't that be great? Because look at this rose oil that reduces blood pressure. Do you know how hard it is to get somebody on blood pressure medication to stay on it? Because they usually don't get it right the first or the second time. It usually takes maybe two or three times of reducing the medication, the dosage, increasing it, reducing it until they get it right. A little dangerous. Wouldn't that be great if rose oil, a natural thing, could take it away? Wouldn't it be nice? Because if you show an Alzheimer's patient a picture and say, this is your husband. He's your husband right now. He's always been your husband. The wife will look and say, nope. I don't know. How do you get into that memory? Possibly smells. They're doing some great research on it. Look it up yourself. All right. Uh, 
Here's one last thing about this. Uh, there's a beautiful thing going on. Uh, I only, I don't know if it's beautiful or not. I just think it's beautiful because it fits right into this. It's called uh, pheromone sniffing parties. Pheromone. We know the pheromones we give off. So instead of uh, going on speed dating, picking a partner, what you do is you they send you a T-shirt. Everybody gets the same T-shirt. Let's say 10 women and 10 men get T-shirts. You put on the T-shirt and you wear it for 24 hours. You wear it to bed. You wear it to work. You wear it out of work. You wear it right before you go to the final meeting. Uh, well, not the final meeting, the first meeting. You take off that shirt. You put it in a sealed plastic bag and you bring the bag to this place. The women and the men are separated. Yes, this is a heterosexual dating deal they do. Uh, the men and the women are separated and they're given, the women are given the men's t-shirt and the men are given the women's t-shirt. And what you do is you smell each shirt. Now, the participants weren't allowed to wear perfumes or oils or deodorants of any kind. So what you're smelling is the natural odor of the person. And that is how you decide who you want to date. Uh, I don't know. Look it up. Let me know the results. Put in a comment if you know the results or if you partook in it yourself. Uh, so why do we do it? Why do we have our nose if we don't really use it a lot? What do we use it for? Eh, to a taste, you know, uh, without the taste, our, our smelling would be, and we like to smell, even wine, we smell before we taste it. Uh, like I said, to aid our memory, we know about that. To create an image, advertisers do this. Toothpaste, you know what toothpaste is made of? You know what kind of things those chemicals smell like? But we'll put a hint of mint in it, and it'll be great. Cleaning products, the same thing. All right. That is it. Uh, I'm six minutes over. My, but you know what? There's no penalty. Ah, I make the rules. That's it. So listen, here's what's going on. Uh, we've done verbal messages. We've done nonverbal. Uh, my next video will be about emotional uh, messages. Uh, a lot of great stuff in that. Uh, emotions, are you kidding me? In other words, when somebody uh, hurts us, why do we not say we're hurt? Why do we say we're angry at them? When somebody disappoints us, why do we, say, why do we not say we're disappointed? We say we're angry at them. Uh, we always go to the anger. I just had some things on my mind and I, I didn't say hello to a person twice. And uh, I just found out that that person said they didn't want to work with me anymore, uh, which I, I, I totally can't understand that. They went right to the anger aspect of it. Instead of coming up to me and saying, uh, I'm confused as to why you've said hi to me all these times, but this time I passed you twice and you didn't say hi to me. Instead, they let somebody else know that they were angry with me. Can you imagine that? So we always go, so these emotional messages, we, we've got to strain out. Uh, we always go to the anger. Uh, there are so many more emotions. So we will deal with that. Uh, if you like these videos, I do a lot of short ones as well, which supplement these larger ones. You can hit that subscribe button. And by the way, uh, put some comments in. If I see some comments, uh, I'll make a short video. If I see enough comments, start a conversation going. If you'd like, if I see the comments about it, uh, even if it's one or if there's a conversation going, I might back off until I can jump in. But either way, I, I would love to, to start having this interact a little bit more. Check out the short videos uh, for reminders of what you've learned on these larger ones and some newer stuff. All right, thanks a lot, guys. Yabba dabba do. Have a great rest of your day or night whenever you are, uh, whatever time of day you're watching me. All right, that's it. Later. Thanks.